Welcome back to the Theocracy Podcast. Oh boy, we got a different one for you today. This was a talk show that I called into about a little over a year ago, January 3rd, 2021, to a show called uh, Talk Heathen. I would have preferred to like just go in and strike up a conversation, get to know people a little bit, but they actually already have some videos, which one of which I allude to. Um, some videos about their past history, their conversion to atheism. This is an atheist talk show. Uh, I can't actually remember. There's two people interviewing me here. One is named V and the other is Eric. So I remember vaguely watching several of their like introductory videos about how they quote unquote came to the faith of atheism. Uh, and if I remember correctly, V's struck a chord with me in that she just had a really awful church experience. She had, if I remember correctly, um, she had difficult questions and things that she was uncomfortable with in scripture and um, basically was just told to ignore all that or just the pastor gave her really, really unsatisfactory answers. And she might have also seen, I'm sure she saw some, some uh, unsavory stuff going on in the church masquerading as religion. So that part of it really resonated with me because I feel a lot the same way. Um, people don't typically give very good answers, at least in my opinion, and are kind of unsatisfied, leave you with a empty, empty stomach. Uh, not because you threw up, just because they didn't feed you anything. So anyway, this is uh, not for the faint of heart. Um, this is a very difficult conversation to go into something with an, a, a uh, hardcore atheist, I would say, because either, I mean, here are the logical possibilities. Either I'm wrong, in which case I believe it's Paul that says that we of all people are most to be pitied. If Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain. And we are of all people most to be pitied. So that's a pretty big if. And then on the other side, if they're incorrect, then they spend eternity in hell. And um, uh, on top of sort of the lesser thing, which is still pretty serious, of blasphemy, um, living a life as though God doesn't exist and saying it routinely on a weekly basis with people. And uh, there's... It's a difficult subject. <laughs> Blasphemy is a capital offense. So this is not small bones we're talking about here. And I haven't watched this in, I think I watched it within a few days after they posted it. It was a live show. And then, so it was live on YouTube. And then they posted it. I think it was up. Um, you can still go back and see and it'll like replay the live comments and all that stuff. I'll have the link in the description in the show notes. Uh, let's see. Uh, there may be some blaspheming in the midst of all of this. Uh, I don't remember. Um, it if if you haven't done this very much, your heart will be racing. Um, I think I'm pretty sure my heart was racing on top of it being a live show, talking with atheists, not knowing what they're going to say. I mean, as far as scripture is concerned, these people are fools. They're enemies of God. But then how am I to come across to them? They're spiritually dead. So the only thing that I can do to them is show them a physical manifestation of what it means to be a believer and to show them how we treat enemies. And these people are enemies, are enemies of God. So then what do we do with them? Do we berate them? Do we treat them rudely? The gospel in, in one sense to the proud is not fun news to hear because the gospel has to be preceded with you're in trouble. You're, you're going to die. That's not fun news to hear to anybody. So, and we say it with the intent of healing afterwards. But if, if the patient, so to speak, is not convinced that he's going to die, then you can bet he's not going to go into surgery because it costs a lot of money and it's going to hurt and there's going to be a recovery process. So if you don't need surgery, you know, what, what do you need the gospel for? So anyway, I will be offering some commentary along the way. Um, there was some, there was a bit of delay. I was calling in over VoIP 
unfortunately where I was at the time, I did not have good cell reception. So there's like a two second delay from when I talked, when I could hear them talk and then I would respond immediately. And there's like a two second, two second lag before you, before you hear it on their end. So I, I may interject some things that I wish I had said differently in the heat of the moment. You, you always, uh, don't give the most reasoned response. Like if it was an email back and forth where you can think for hours or days about your response, but it is what it is. Let's get into it. Let's go with Adam in Texas. Adam, you're live with Eric and V. Hello Adam? there. How are you all for this evening? Or this doing afternoon? all right. We're doing good. Yeah. Where are you at, man? I am in North Texas, almost Oklahoma. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. Okay. Nice. I've probably driven through then. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks for calling in. What can I help you with today? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I wanted to say, Vi, I really resonated with your story I listened to recently, your conversion story. So um, it, it resonates with me a lot. Um, secondly, the main thing would be, um, I believe that the, the old covenant slavery system is actually better than the prison slavery system that we have today. So like I mentioned earlier, um, I would have preferred to go in and just start up a conversation, but I understand for the show, they need somebody, they basically required that I come forth with a statement or a declaration that they would have a chance to then respond to. I would have preferred to call in like with a question or something like that, but the person screening the calls uh, wanted to know what the topic was and they actually give precedence is not the right word. What the, what's the word I'm looking for? They give preference to theists and they actually put atheists to the back of the line, which I actually really admire that. Okay. Starting again. It sounds like you're conflating slavery with imprisonment. Right. Yeah. That's, that's not a thing. Well, Those are different. I, I don't know. I could say that modern day slavery in the U.S. is uh, imprisonment in the U.S. is similar to slavery in a lot of ways. Sure. I mean, I, I think that we need to do a better job, but it's still conflating two different things. You have some. They're you know, two you, entirely you, different structures. You have, a, you have a human being being owned as property, and in lots of slavery systems, including the one in the United States and in the Bible, you have uh, people and their children being owned as property. Um, and you also understand that. These, these people are not being viewed as humans, right? Even in prison, yes, we'll take away some rights, like um, the right to own a gun, uh, but we still treat them as a human being. I would interject here. In scripture, they're also considered humans as well. People can be owned and still be considered human. So the idea that if somebody is property, then that means that they're no longer human. Well, God owns us. God owns a free man, so God has ultimate property rights. So in that sense, are you saying that Christians don't believe that a free man is human because he's owned as property by God? That doesn't quite follow. Continuing. Mm, we want to. Here's, I, 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 I have lots of feelings about the prison system in the U.S. I do too, but that's this is... That's getting in the way of this. Yes, it is. My, 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 <laughs> I'm going to cut to the chase with you, Adam, and say that I might agree that how they decided to use indentured servitude for other Hebrews at the time is better than some of the prison systems in the U.S. At first, when she said that, that surprised me. But then also she caveated that with the way Hebrews would own other Hebrews. To her, that's more acceptable. Um, what she's referring to there is... Uh, for Hebrews, you weren't allowed to own another Hebrew slave longer than uh, he had to be set free uh, because he was your, uh, I believe the passage says that he is your brother. Uh, you can't own him as a slave. You own him for six years, no matter how huge the debt is that made him your slave or what he did that made him your slave. Um, whether he was just financially unstable and had to sell himself to you or... Uh, if he stole something or was just in debt and couldn't pay it back, let's say he borrowed something extremely valuable from you and then it got destroyed or died. Well, now he's depending on the situation, he may be on the hook for that. So he would have to pay back 
And well, if he can't afford it, let's say, you know, this is somebody who has a nine to five, has nothing in savings and only makes, you know, uh, a few thousand dollars a month. And then he borrows some, something really expensive from you, a really, really nice car and it gets, he wrecks it or it gets stolen or something like that. Um, obviously now we have insurance and uh, further agreements that limit liability and things like that. But saying he decided not to get insurance and then wrecks it. Well, okay. Yeah. He's on the hook for it. So he would sell himself to you to basically pay that back. But there were limits for, there were extra limits for one Hebrew. And I would say today that would be the same as believer one believer being in debt to another believer. There's a cap on that of six years. And then the seventh, he's supposed to go free though. And th I think she's about to get into this. Um, a Hebrew owning a non-Hebrew slave from another nation, let's say captured in war, or let's say he was a sojourner and was not a proselyte. Then there was, there was no limit on how long he could be a slave. He would be enslaved. He could be perpetually enslaved and his children that were born while under, uh, or maybe, maybe if his whole family came in, um, I, th I would think it would just be him if he came in married and then let's say had children while enslaved then, or let's say you gave him a wife and then when he would leave, you would get to keep his children as well. Or let's say he died and his children were born to a woman that you gave him for a wife. Well, his children are now still your slaves. And if they don't proselytize, then they can be perpetual slaves for generation after generation. So that's what, that's what she's referring to. But I do not agree that what they did to outsiders is better. And that was just as condoned as indentured servitude of fellow Hebrews. Yeah. So that's my take on that. Uh, why do you, sure, uh, why do you say that? Why do you say because that the, the way they the, were outsiders is worse than what we've got now? I, I don't understand, hold on, where, where's this conversation going? I, 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 is this a conversation to prop up the idea that the Bible is a moral book? Yes. Okay, well, so you no. think the Bible is moral? It's, an, but if it's, Yes, I'm a theist. Uh, oh, that's the, those are two different things. My yeah, you know, we, we've actually specifically gone over a, a type of theism that we've been studying, um, process. Process theology. Yeah. With, Guys, if any of you are process theologians or, or interested in that. Please call. Please call. I'm so excited to talk to you. Sorry. I'm actually not sure what they're referring to here, process theologian. But if they're excited to talk to people with that, it usually means it's an off the wall thing. But obviously not always. They were kind of thrilled to talk to me that I thought Old Testament law had any uh, uh, any bearing on modern life whatsoever, much less all of it has bearing on life today. Um, Adam, here's the thing. Um, you can, even if we were to agree for the sake of the argument that what is in the Bible is better than what we have now in certain situations, why on earth would that make that equal that the Bible is moral? I could say that hitting someone is better than killing them, but I'm not going to condone hitting people as a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that was, right. I was I, gonna, I, I was... misspoke. I guess the I'm not I'm not arguing that um, slavery or in the Bible makes the Bible moral. Uh, I think that the Bible's the reason that it's moral is based on something more fundamental. Okay, so why are we talking about slavery? Like I mentioned earlier, they, they required that I come in with like an, uh, a, uh, a statement, uh, or something that I was going to be willing to argue and defend rather than come in with a question. And I thought that this would be an interesting, interesting thing. Uh, they do talk about slavery some, but I can't imagine that they've had any other callers call in to actually defend biblical slavery as good and right for today. So that was the, one of the reasons I brought it up. I thought it would be fun. Uh, I was half wrong, half right. They're kind of, they're kind of confused, maybe thinking I'm being disingenuous <laughs> and they don't know any of this. They don't know who I am. They don't know about the podcast or anything. So it's, it's interesting. They become very skeptical here. If you watch the video. Um, I, I, that's just what I wanted to call in and, and talk about. Okay. Well, okay. I'm willing to grant for the sake of this conversation that certain things in the Bible are probably better than certain things that exist today. 
Uh, certainly there were no atomic bombs in the Bible. It means that the Bible is in that way better because we didn't have the capacity to kill millions of people. Um, but that to me doesn't translate to anything other than a cool, I guess there were some things that were better and some things that were worse at different time periods. And yeah. I'm not sure how that ties into your ultimate point, which I'm assuming has to do with proving either the veracity of the Bible or God or something. So what's the end goal for you here? Oh, um, well, I'm, I'm what I guess what you call a, um, a presuppositionalist. Oh, uh, uh, well, this is, I think you're the first precept to start with a slavery argument. Yeah. That's an interesting combo right there. Oh, well, cheers. Like, it's like a I guess there's a half iced tea, half lemonade. Uh, you know what? I kind of got a, a craving for that. I'm yeah, right. Arnold Palmer on, yeah, on I got one. the uh, talking show. I couldn't see what they were doing at this point. They're both taking a drink of a twisted tea. The uh, there was a video s about a year ago of some guy smashing another one in a smashing somebody in the head with a twisted tea in a convenience store, and it just smashed open. So. They're both taking a long drink here, so I thought this was my time to talk, and they're they're making it funny. So I I keep talking here. Yeah, uh, we didn't want to openly endorse an alcoholic beverage, so we kind of put a little tape. It yeah. actually was kind of a nice grip. It's a it's a good, <laughs> kind of nice grip. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Oh um, well, yeah. So the the presuppositional argument, like I, that's. So I'm not using this argument to to show that the Bible is moral. I think it's moral just be based on its own merits, like it's a self, self-authenticating self argument. <laughs> the slavery so, system is just a natural result of it being good. Okay. Wow, okay, that's an interesting claim. <laughs> They're very confused here. Yeah, so, so, so hold on a second. You're saying the Bible validates itself, which makes it true. Is that correct? Right. Okay, cool. Uh, where's my book of Eric? It's over there. Sorry, oh, here it is. So I didn't know this at the time, but uh, reading through some of the comments later, uh, this is a, a common thing that he would do. He he talks about, uh, he brings up his own book that he says, well, I get to presuppose my own book, the book of Eric, and whatever it says is true because it's in the book of Eric, just like, just like the Bible. And so I think a lot of people, uh, it sounds like not very many people have been able to answer this argument just because of uh, how quickly he, he brought it up. Um, but I think I take I take this in a different direction than I think most people would, and I think you'll find this interesting. My book says that it's true. It says everything written in this book is true. So does that mean that everything spelled everything in my book is true? Not necessarily. We would have to look. But, but it says so. And we would also have to agree on what's the correct result. Well, well it, it says two it, plus it, two equals four. That it is and. Well, there's a difference between some the reason that something is true and also how we know that it is true. I agree. Okay, so so if we were to evaluate my book and it says two plus two equals four, and then we look at the claim that everything in this book is true, hey, we'll agree, right? Cool. Okay. Also in this yeah. book, also in this book, it says that I created the universe. Would you still agree that everything in this book is true? Well, we would examine the fruits of that. So if you created the universe, then you get to determine how it runs. No, you don't. We would look at your... Not necessarily. I mean, I, so, so imagine an entity that simply all it can do is poof a universe into existence. That's it. Okay. Okay. Then no, that entity would not have control over the universe. It wouldn't have to, you know, it wouldn't be making moral decisions. It would just poof a universe into existence. The thing is, you're carrying a lot of assumptions that are attached to your god to the idea that that you know a universe creating entity would need to have those, which I think is where we're going to be breaking down. There's an assessment of of what those things would be that we're just not in agreement with, and I think that's where we're going to have a have be you know having an issue. So in other words, what he's saying is, um, well, in my book, something creating it means that it doesn't necessarily have control. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that that's also written in the book of Eric. Um, and so, okay, well, so then it would go on to define what the rights of the creator are. And then that's in the book of Eric as well. And in this book of Eric, uh, 
creating something doesn't mean you have control over it. So I'm at, at this point, I was kind of unsure where he was going with this. Um, as far as him saying that he's the creator of the universe, but then that doesn't actually have any basis on how we should live or what we should do. I'm sort of like, okay, there's really nothing for me to argue with. If you want to say something factual, but then it doesn't actually change anything. Uh, so yeah, I was sort of like, what, what is there, what is there to argue with here? Okay. I guess, I guess um, you misunderstand me. I don't think that something that creates the universe necessarily has to have laws for it. I'm just saying that's the that's the way that the beings that are created within that universe would know who the creator is. If that makes well, sense. I, I I wrote them a book based on his work. It's though. right here. No, they got a book. It's right here. But they don't see any. Well, in that sense, I guess it would be self-evident to them that they are they are made things. Ah, so then I am God. Also, if he says, hey, I'm going to create a thing called pizza and it is good and it will be called pizza and pizza exists, that's proof that he created the universe, right? Because the So there's a difference. What I'm trying to get at here is there are moral realities and moral consequences to things. They're focusing more on the facts, um, like something something exists or not exists or does not exist. What I'm thinking about is uh, I'm trying to take them further than something existing or not existing. I'm trying to take them to the idea that if God says he exists, he doesn't just say he exists. He also commands us to do certain things and live a certain way. And so just saying that God exists, I'm like, for me throughout this whole conversation, that's a given. I assume, I assume God exists. God proves himself that's the thing that they have issue with and we'll get into that there's a lot of other things i want to bring up uh in relation to that but we'll we'll get to it they, they can see yeah. the fruits of his of his work yeah, yeah i would say that a, a one of the ways that we know that a being exists is by examining the things that it does so no um i, I actually well, yes, but first we have to determine whether the being exists. Yeah. And then we can say, okay, what kind of being is this? And, and what does it do? And where does it live? And what does it eat? Right? We can yeah. do that. But first and foremost, we have to determine that the thing exists before we can study it. Yeah. If, and, and just as an example, if we were to be talking about whether or not a lawnmower exists, yes, we can, we can look at the, the mowed lawn and things like that. But if we're talking about that lawnmower, bring in the lawnmower. You need to show that it exists. Otherwise, how do I know that you weren't sitting out on your lawn with scissors? It's just, you can show that the lawnmower exists without having to turn it on. Right. The, the difficulty comes when you're, now it's the lawnmower trying to determine whether somebody made it or not. No, in our analogy, the lawnmower is God. And yeah. what we're determining is whether or not the lawnmower exists by the fact that the grass got cut. It okay. might be well, you can just go it might I mean, somebody with a direction too. Well, yeah, it could go either direction, but this is the direction we're going. I guess my question for you, Adam, is then it would be the grass. In any other situation, do you use this kind of logic? Do you use this kind of logic to determine a thing because the thing itself said it? It's circular. That's a really good point that she's making. Uh, in one sense, Actually, I would say in every sense, the answer is that that is no. When we approach our highest source of truth, it, it basically is the end of the road when you start asking the question, why? So we exist. Why? God made us. Why? Because he wanted to. Why? Because he wanted to. Why? Because he wanted to. Like, that's where it ends. It's the same thing for... Um, I've heard them talk in other videos about consciousness and how we can't account for consciousness. We don't know what it is. We don't know where it comes from. Th these are the things that they're saying. So when we get to consciousness, that's your end of the road. We're conscious. Why? Because I know it. Why? Or maybe it ends with an I don't know. But still, like that's your logical end of the road. So when you get to that point being circular becomes necessary because it's your it's your ultimate source like why is truth true 
Well, because that it is by definition. That's how we define it. Okay, well, then you've reached the end of the road there. So there are certain things that are your ultimate logic. It it can't be circular, like arbitrary. Like I get to go, I get to drive a hundred miles an hour down the road, even though it says 60. Why? Because I say so. Well, no, <laughs> um, that would be an example of being circular and being arbitrary. But when you get to the end of your reasoning to where you have to loop back on itself to answer your own question, like consciousness or logic, why is logic logical? Why is truth true? They just, they are by definition. It's like, that's, that's what it means. And that's, I mean, there's no really outside answer. If something else makes truth true, um, let's say that the number 10 makes truth true. Well, then what gives number 10, the number 10, the right to define truth as being true? Um, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to keep going further than that. Um, they use the same question like, well, who created God? Well, God is uncreated. <laughs> he's, he's everlasting. Something that has no end needs no beginning, logically speaking. So... Yeah, I probably have talked too long about this, but I hope you understand the point. And I know for a fact that you can't go through life like that, or you're going to get into some real trouble. You're open to scams and con artists and probably, you know, basic things like math. <laughs> like all of that's going to be a problem for you if you use circular logic elsewhere. So why is it okay here? Um, it's because when you get to the top of the, the, um, the truth chain, I suppose, like why does this because this, why is this, because this. Like when you go backwards all the way up that, when you right. finally get to the end, it's it's that thing looping back on itself. Actually, it's I don't know. It, it, you loop it back on itself when you don't have a better answer. Um, but Descartes got it wrong. Um, it's I don't know. That He's referring to I think because I am. Descartes' famous reasoning is like the most basic fundamental presupposition of Descartes is, I think, therefore I am, or why do I think? And Eric here is saying, I think because I don't know. That's, that's the honest response. Or he also, he was also a presuppositionalist in the famous, I think, therefore I am. He assumed I, I think, well, how do you know it's you that's thinking? It's... That is an awesome conversation for another day. <laughs> um, but just just responding here, d does that does that help? It doesn't necessarily loop back on itself. It, it, it winds up getting to a place of I don't know. And that's good. There's a word for it. Aporia. Well, I think at least that's honest. But, but the person that says I don't know can't necessarily say that he knows that somebody else doesn't know. Well, that then it is important for the person who says, so explaining what I'm doing here. So if this person says, well, where does, let's say these atheists saying they don't know, or why are we conscious? Where does consciousness come from? They get to say, we don't know. But then that also doesn't mean that they get to deny somebody else's claim that they do, which is obviously this, the claim that scripture has. God is revealing himself to us. How do we know that? So now we're getting, I'm finally, I think I'm pushing them to the place where it's not just a claim, it's a claim saying how I'm supposed to live and there are consequences. Bad things will happen if I don't do what I'm told to do and good things will happen if I do do what I'm told to do. Listening back to this, I don't feel like I'm taking them there. I think they're they're very well practiced in, in having these conversations, which is good. It kind of covers, covers for some of my foibles. They're forcing me to get to the end and I should have been better doing that. As they know, to come up and show evidence for it, right? We're saying, I don't know. You're the one coming to us with a claim. So we're asking for you to provide evidence. And that seems only fair. We're not necessarily saying that we know you're wrong. We're saying, we know that we're not convinced you're right. Yeah. Those are different things. And it's largely important. It's it actually, it's, it's incredibly important because it's why we want to have a conversation with you. We have this show so people can call in, tell us what they believe and why, and if they convince us, well, listen, I mean, it's, it's, it's that, it's that simple. We're not, you know, being stubborn about it. We just want to have good reasons for believing the things that we do. I, I applaud him from saying that, but then also it brings up the, the, 
I believe it's in Psalms that says that uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So you, you really can't get around the moral culpability for saying that there is no God. Romans 1 says that everybody, everybody knows that God exists. There's no excuse. They've seen his works and they still refuse to believe what he says. This is not a, this is not somebody who can't do a math problem. This is somebody who sees it, sees the truth, and then outright refuses to believe it because it conflicts with the way that they want to behave. So one way or another, either I'm being disingenuous and saying that, and I don't get to say it, or they're being disingenuous and it's true. There's, there's no way around that. You can't have both of them. No, and I commend you guys for that. I think a lot of Christians miss that, that you do need the evidence. And Jesus said that people will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And I think ah. people that have been turned off to Christianity because Christians aren't doing a very good job uh, doing what their book tells them to do. And then unbelievers look at them and say, look, those people don't know God. And like, yeah, right. They don't know God because they're not obeying what God will do you remember doing that in church? Oh, all the time. And, yeah. and I would love to just take, like, if this were just my show and there wasn't an audience that was expecting other things, I would take that sentence and just dissect. Because in some areas I agree, in some areas I strongly disagree. I think that Christians are doing a very bad job if what they want to convey is love for all of humanity. But I also think that mo the, mo the Christians I agree with the most and surround myself with when I want to engage with Christians are those that neglect most of what the Bible says and follows their own morality and their own moral code in a way that is humanistic. So yes and I guess for that for me, but my, my whole, this whole thing is interesting because we started off talking about slavery and we ended up way in left field. So is this where you wanted to end up? <laughs> is this the conversation you wanted to have? And did we answer your question? I, I, I mean, I, well, yeah, and I've never called in before. This is, I think this is sort of a good um, get to know you call. So I, I sort of assumed yeah. that it was gonna, we were gonna go all over the place just to sort of touch on the main things that you guys like to touch on all the time. And then maybe I was thinking maybe branch off to slavery, but um, I figured it was good to have a particular thing to bring up to begin the conversation. Well, I appreciate you calling in. I enjoyed this conversation. And if you want to call back, what we generally tell people is if you could pick one claim that is the one that clinched it for you, that's the one we want to talk about. That's the interesting stuff for us, because if we're going to talk about a claim and then end up maybe debunking it, and that's not going to change your opinion or our opinion, then, then why are we having the time. conversation? So definitely call in again, but come with something that's really meaty, that's really juicy, that really you know gets you excited, because um, that's something I'd be interested to talk about. If you, I do have uh, my testimony up earlier on the channel. If you want to scroll back to one of the older episodes, I believe it is. Let me look. That is episode number five. If you want to go back and take a listen to that, that's probably what I would call in um, just to give my testimony. The thing that clinched it for me, the thing that made me understand it. Um, and I don't think I've mentioned this, uh, and there, it's not on video anywhere. It's just my testimony is just an audio recording. If you go back and listen to it uh, for probably like the last five or 10 minutes, I'm just bawling my eyes out. My voice doesn't change very much, but, uh, I just remember trying to get through the end of it where I'm just bawling. Um, and where I actually give my, my testimony with my dad giving the example with my brother getting a spanking and all that. Um, I was, I didn't cry then, but I was pretty teary eyed as well. So I, I have not called back in again since, since this, but uh, maybe I'll do that. I had forgotten about that. One other thing I'd be really excited to talk yeah, about. I think next time I'll is, call in, I'll share my testimony if that would be okay. Uh, well, I think I would go back and watch earlier episodes where we talk about testimony beforehand. That way you can see kind of, how we address that. Um, what I'm really interested in, and we don't have to talk about this today, is how you get out of the no true Scotsman fallacy. There are plenty of Christians who call themselves Christians who do not advocate for love that way, or they think that the love that they need to show is tough love. Um, and 
I would not say that they're not true Christians. Um, they're just different. Well, I actually appreciated that Adam didn't say they weren't Christians, just that they weren't doing a good job, which is mm. important. You, you, you have to be able to hold your side accountable, right? There are plenty of atheists who well, do awful stuff, and we need to hold them accountable as fellow atheists, not say, oh, well, they're not even part of the group, so they're not my problem. Well, but the thing is, is there are, I'm sure there are Christians who would say, no, we are doing a good job. They're not, there's, there's that not is an the, agreement. That is the question. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's not an agreement on that. How do you determine what a good Christian is? Because the people who are not doing Christianity yep. the way you would do it still think they're doing it correctly. So yeah. then that, that becomes the conversation, which would be interesting. So, yeah. That's the whole, <laughs> that's the whole reason that my podcast exists. So good on, good on V for saying that. I'm still not exactly sure how to pronounce her name. I said Vi when I got on the show, but then she, uh, Eric introduces her as V. So I'll call her V. Call back and uh, we'll have another conversation. I appreciate shows like this where you can talk about things like this at length because this isn't a, a time. I mean, this, these types of conversations are unfortunately not uh, encouraged on Sunday morning. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. We, that's, that's the, that's the point. That's what we want. We're glad that you found the show. Um, and, uh, we look forward to you calling it again. Absolutely. Thanks Adam. Take care. Thank you very much. All right. So that was the 16 minute clip. They had separated this out the full length show. Uh, I'll provide a link to the full show and just my segment. Their full length show was almost an hour and 40 minutes long. So, um, you can get an idea for the other, the other callers before and after me. Um, but yeah, this is just a show that you can call in. Um, it's really good. It's really good practice. Um, I think every argument besides presuppositional presuppositionalism falls apart in terms of ultimate truth for God. But then one thing I mentioned that I didn't really get into, uh, I mentioned on, on the call with them was like examining the fruits of that. And I think I said, uh, specifically, we would have to agree on what the fruits are or what the goals are. So Deuteronomy 28 is that chapter. So like, if you disobey, these things will happen. If you obey, these things will happen. And the best, the, the litmus test for us to show unbelievers that what God says is true is we obey God blesses us because he promised he would. And then other people look at us, look at the success and we get to point them to God and say, this is where our success comes from, not our works, but because we love the person who made us and we're showing that we're really showing you God. We're not showing you ourselves the things that we own because we don't own anything. But uh, there's one resource that I'm thinking of that would be really good uh, that I recommend. It's called How to Answer the Fool. Um, there's a guy named Cy Tin Bruggenkate who is, does a really good job. He's typically not very nice and he will drill into people, uh, which is not really fair because at the end of the day, somebody who says, I mean, they said it, you get to the end and the answer is, I don't know, which is, <laughs> which is false according to scripture. They do know that God exists. They do know what he requires of them. They have a conscience. Um, you'll notice throughout this whole conversation, they assume good and evil. They said all sorts of things about, they agreed with problems with the prison system, but they don't have any account for where those oughts come from. Um, I know we, we both have the same world that we're looking at their world. They see consequences of good things and bad things. And I have the same world that I get to point to as well. You can get caught up in all these logical uh, reasons. At the end of the day, I really think it comes down to how do you live your life? Can somebody look at you and say, that person is exhibiting life and this person is not? That's really the place where we have the most opportunity to shut the mouths of unbelievers. Where they get to look at us, they get to look at what we do, what we say, and how they match up and the results that that produces. And they say, I really don't have an answer for why that person gets those results behaving that way. I mean, when they get to heaven, they're not going to have an excuse. So our goal is to sort of bring, bring a view of heaven to them in this life so that their mouths will be shut. And uh, that's what my testimony did for me. 
So I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you found it helpful. It's good practice. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at T-H-E-E-O-C-R-A-T at gmail.com, theocrat at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.